Yesterday's and <laughs> yesterday and today's lunch. Uh, so I'm going to try and keep it light, but I do have this is kind of a methods uh, talk. So there are going to be some integrals and equations. So, uh, but I'm going to help you kind of pull you through these. So my name is Ilan uh, Gronau. I'm a faculty at the CS department at Herzliya Interdisciplinary Center. It's a small institute right north of uh, Tel Aviv. And uh, the talk I'm going to give today, it's going to be slightly different from what I kind of uh, thought I would talk about. It's going to be on uh, demography inference. That was in the title. But so I gave a talk a tutorial last year in the long course on uh, Bayesian demography inference. And uh, toward the end of that tutorial, I talked about a problem that I've been thinking about in the past few years, a uh, model comparison in this context and uh, about the harmonic mean estimator and why it's nice and why it doesn't work and to kind of give intuition to what I think we can do to actually make things better. And as I made that talk and uh, returned back uh, home and talked to my student, Ron, who was working on this, then kind of that talk initiated a spurt of work that we've been doing this year, and I'm going to talk about this today. So uh, it's going to be, the talk is going to be mostly focused on this idea of relative Bayes factors that I only kind of hinted to last year, and I'm going to be able to expand a bit more uh, today. So it's kind of uh, inspired by, by my talk last year. <laughs> so uh, demography inference is kind of a ubiquitous uh, problem in population genetics. Uh, and it's a problem where we take uh, genome sequences and try to use the patterns of variation in these sequences to kind of reconstruct the population history. So it's, you can think of it as an extension of the uh, phylogenetic inference problem. So, but demography inference, demography, demographic histories are a bit more complicated than regular phylogenetic trees. There are different ways you can, can describe them. We're going to stick to this sort of description where you have a tree. So there is an underlying tree. And the branches here represent not your individuals, but the populations that these individuals kind of belong to. And so the uh, demographic history is a tree. And you have a series of split events where populations split. And each branch in this tree is associated with kind of a typical size. So uh, the, each branch has a constant size, but the sizes can change. Like in the split event, these two uh, daughter branches can have a different size than the parent branch, right? So size can somewhat change through history. And we allow kind of violation of the tree structure by adding these migration bands that allow us to model gene flow between populations that have already diverged. So uh, that's an essential kind of component in these types of models. Otherwise, it's a pretty much kind of a, a fancy phylogenetic model. So we want to be able to infer these types of histories, uh, the structure and the parameter values from genome sequence data. So there are a lot of ways to do that. But if you want to be able to solve this problem, first you have to understand the models, right? How population history affects uh, genome sequence variation. And Kirk talked a bit about that in his talk about um, about uh, uh, dominance, uh, about uh, kind of dominance coefficients. He had to kind of factor out the effect of demography. We're going to be interested actually in understanding this demography, and I'm going to show you also an example why it can be cool and interesting to do that, even if you're not interested in GWAS or uh, dominance coefficients and things like that. So if you want to model how population history affects uh, genomes, uh, the right way to do it is to kind of add something here in the middle. And if you were in the retreat, you should know what comes here. Does anybody remember? Let's see how good you are. Here comes the ancestral recombination graph, the ARG. That's what I talked about in the retreat. So I'm, this is going to, I'm going to have only a few slides with the ARG and then move away. But I, I do think it's very important to think about this in the middle, and what is this ancestral recombination graph? It's the structure that tells us how our individuals, how our individual genomes related to each other in different parts, right? So 
you can think of it in each segment of these genomes the related you can describe the relation using a tree of kind of common ancestors going back in time and this tree changes along the sequence due to recombination events that's where the recombination comes from so it's kind of a series of shifting trees along the genome so if you really want to model this process you have to you have to think about the ARG but most methods that actually do inference don't explicitly model the ARG because it's very very complicated there's no method today and it doesn't seem very realistic to do inference with co like complete uh, consideration of uh, the ARG. So people do various different things. They use, uh, they use SNPs and assume that they are completely independent, meaning that their genealogies are uh, independent, which, which is obviously a violated assumptions, but, but that works pretty well. Another kind of approach on the other side of the spectrum, if you're interested in very recent demography, then you can kind of cut, cut the time for the past, say, 100 generations and just try to kind of infer the ARG in, in these 100 generations and then the inference is pretty much uh, obtained by deciding, by kind of uh, being able to infer pairs of haplotypes, pairs of stretches of sequences that have shared ancestry within these 100 generations. So that's like identity by descent type methods, that's pretty much what they do. It's a way, it's an ARG way to think about these methods. So every method that you know of or heard of that does do demography inference, it, it has an ARG in the background, but usually they kind of try not to think about it. So we're going to talk about a particular type of uh, methods that don't completely use the ARG, but, but do, I guess, a bit more maybe than other methods. Uh, so this is what happens when you zoom out. One of the problems is that this tree changes a lot, right? So if you really want to model everything, you have to model this very complicated correlation structure. So what you can do is uh, treat your genomes, not really analyze the entire genome, but really analyze very short windows, and then assume that each window is narrow enough so that it's actually generated by a single non-recombining tree, like this, right? and you select these windows in places where they'll be likely to fall in neutral regions of the genome, like far away from genes, and far away enough from each other so that you can assume they're independent, and short enough so that you can assume there's no recombination. So all of these assumptions are violated to some extent, but this works reasonably well, and uh, it's actually nice, again, because you have now the structure, you don't really have to model recombination, you do have to understand these processes, how genealogies relate to population histories and how sequence data relates to genealogies, but all of this has pretty much been figured out in the past, I don't know, 30 uh, or more years. So how does this look like? So what these type of demography inference methods, what, what do they look like? So as input, they get two things. First of all, they get the sequence data, which is just a, a collection of these short alignments along the genome. It's like thousands of ten of thousands of these alignments. Uh, that's one part of the uh, input. And another part is the structure of this model. So the inference doesn't deal directly with inferring the actual structure. It assumes a structure, so you give it like a structure of a tree and a set of these migration bands and what the what the inference methods try to do is uh, output values of the model parameters so the split times the population sizes and migration rates uh, that fit your data kind of uh, in in some ideal way that's that's the objective and the way they do it is kind of explicitly modeling these hidden genealogies in the middle. So you don't completely model the ARG because you don't model recombination, but you, model, you explicitly model this aspect of it in, in these independent uh, local trees. By the way, this is a good point to say that if anybody has questions, then feel free to stop me as I dash through. So being a bit more formally, so yeah, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> so this tree should, should the, the R should reflect the population tree? 
they shouldn't have the same structure because there is incomplete lineage sorting, so they're not so they are embedded in this population tree, but the coalescent events can be deeper, so the structure doesn't have to be the same. Okay, so to be a bit formal, so our input, as we said, is the model M and X the data, and what we want to be able to do is sample values of the model parameters, theta, based on the posterior probability probability of theta given x and m. This is what we want to be able to do in kind of a Bayesian setting, right? Uh, but the problem is that we can't, we can't sample from this distribution and we can't even compute this distribution or the joint distribution of theta and x given m. Uh, and the reason is that, that to do this we really have to kind of integrate this uh, hidden layer in the middle and that's, that's not tractable. So what we do if we think kind of a bit in a Bayesian framework in MCMC sampling is that we explicitly add that hidden layer to our model and this makes now the likelihood is becomes tractable and we use these genealogies kind of as a guide in a sampling scheme. So let's go over this uh, likelihood that it's kind of important to understand uh, the model, uh, the modeling assumptions that are made here. So the joint probability of the data and the model parameters, which is what we want to infer, and the genealogies, which are hidden, but we don't care about them. They're kind of nuisance parameters. Uh, their joint probability given the model is given by the prior of the model parameters given the model. It's Bayesian framework, so we always have a prior. Uh, and then, once the parameters and model are set, once all of this is set, then the loci are completely independent. That's kind of the main assumption here, right? So we just take a product for each locus, and in each locus, the probability of the data and the genealogy given the model can be factored out to the probability of the genealogy uh, GI given the model and its parameters. That's a coalescent based model here. And then the probability of the local alignment given the genealogy, so once the genealogy is given, the data doesn't depend at all on the history because the mutations occur on this genealogy. They don't occur in the context of population. So that's why the, ge well, sorry. That's why the genealogies really help us here. Uh, so in each locus we have these two, uh, we have these two factors. So it's a pretty, pretty nice and easy, uh, uh, an easy formula to compute if we had the model parameters and the genealogies, which we don't have, but using an MCMC framework, we can now use this uh, likelihood function to guide our sampling of model parameters. So how does that work? Uh, our sampling algorithm is going to hold a version of all model parameters and these latent genealogies. It's going to store it in its memory. Th this is the input up here, right? And then in each step of the algorithm, it so it starts at some arbitrary point. It, it just uh, guesses the parameters and guesses genealogies and then iteratively updates the, the current kind of state. That's what MCMC does. So here the update can be choose selecting a parameter and slightly perturbing it. That's fairly easy. Uh, or selecting a genealogy and perturbing it slightly, say moving a branch like this branch here. Uh, connecting it here. So we're making a slight change to our kind of the state of our machine and then we look at the likelihood, this complete likelihood function before the update and after the update. If this update increased this joint likelihood then we generally take that uh, update. It depends also on the proposal distribution but let's put that aside. So if we kind of improve our likelihood we take the proposal and if the likelihood is below the previous one, then we uh, choose it with probability that equals the ratio between the likelihood. So we still, we don't reject it if it reduces our likelihood. It's not a, it's not a, a steepest ascent uh, method or something like that. So it does allow the likelihood uh, to drop. And uh, the nice thing about this is that if you do this enough times, then, and if your sampling algorithm is sound, it has to obey certain uh, kind of guidelines, then you're guaranteed after a certain number of uh, samples that you will converge to this posterior probability distribution. So you'll start sampling genealogies and parameter values 
in a distribution that is approximately equal to the uh, posterior probability of g and theta given x and m, which is what you actually wanted. So you don't care about g's, the g's are going to drop, but then you get the probability of theta given x and m, which was our initial objective. So there is a lot of, you know, not getting into any of the details and does this actually work? So the fact that the theory tells you that it will converge doesn't mean that it will effectively converge in our lifetime, right? But it's been shown, we've been shown, and others have been shown that this is actually a useful way to, to, to address this problem and infer good parameters for these models. So just again to make sure that we all understand what this does in, in kind of the detailed aspects of it, so we kind of, the output looks like, like what the algorithm records looks like this. Each line is kind of a description of the state, the genealogies and the thetas in, in a given iteration of the algorithm. And we make these slight perturbations. Uh, we leave out a certain number of these samples, like the first, I don't know, 100,000, uh, whatever we want. It's kind of an arbitrary number that's guided you know, from our first arbitrary guess and assume that now we've pretty much converted to the posterior. So this is going to be our sample set. And we also kind of check, because they're highly correlated, right? We change only a small part in each iteration. Then we make sure the space is far enough apart. Uh, and eventually, we drop everything. We don't really hold the genealogies because we don't care about them. So we only record this. So our output is going to be a table with with parameter values as we sample. And then we just look at various statistics, the means and the confidence intervals. And that tells us you know, what we've learned about the population history. So a, f uh, a bit about the history of these types of methods. So I think the first time this general approach had been uh, suggested was by Felsenstein already in the 90s. But it was in a fairly simple context of uh, of like, I think, a single population. But the idea of sampling genealogies, because it's a hidden uh, variable, that was uh, raised by Felsenstein you know, in a nice series of papers. But then it was kind of extended to multi-population setting, first by, uh, uh, by Rasmus Nielsen and John Wakeley in, in their IM paper in 2001, which has been extended since. Uh, but it's generally, now it works with more populations, but it's generally geared to two or a small number of populations with gene flow. So it's kind of a gene flow centered. That, that's the main thing you want to infer when you use, EM, when you use IM, isolation migration. Uh, kind of an, uh, using the similar approach in more of a, I know, comparative genomics uh, setting was done by uh, Zing Yang and uh, Bruce Ronala in 2003, they developed MCMC coal, now it's called BPNP. So this method uh, is, has now population phylogeny, it's not just two populations or three, it's multi-population but has no gene flow because these are typically closely related species but not populations in the same species. And in 2001 we took kind of the ideas for both of these approaches and, and kind of also boosted the performance, worked a bit about, you know, on the actual sampling algorithm to uh, develop uh, this generalized phylogenetic coalescent sampler, GFOX, that does, you know, infer these complex uh, demographic histories with multiple populations and gene flow. So this is a, an image from a figure from a paper from 2014 they did, I think it was the first time I was in UCLA. I collaborated with John of Amber, who was, I think it was his last year here. And uh, Robert Wayne, he's an evolutionary biologist, does uh, work with dogs and wolves. And we did this nice paper about evolution of dogs, kind of the origins of dogs. So these are dogs and wolves, and you can see a lot of gene flow. And, you know, if I really like this work. I can talk about this offline in coffee if somebody wants. I like. This is also the first time I learned how to draw these nice figures. I've been using it since then, but it's all kind of manually done. I haven't figured a way to do this automatically. Okay, so I do want to show you an example, talk a bit about an example, a more recent one. So this is, uh, this is Bob Wayne, and this is uh, kind of our recent paper. That, so since that paper with, on dogs and wolves, we've done more papers on more kind of studies of uh, of canid evolution, which is really nice. And we've been seeing more and more this uh, kind of uh, this pattern of, of a lot of gene flow. 
So, and we've been getting farther and farther in terms of kind of the phylogenetic scope, and this is kind of work that we're working on now, uh, going all the way to uh, wild uh, African hunting dogs that are really the, kind of on the, the farther spectrum of, of uh, canids, and you can see almost you reach almost uh, onto this kind of uh, um, onto kind of this this level of divergence, and you still see gene flow, right? You still see a bit of gene flow between jackal and doe, which are diverged like more than a million and a half years ago. So that would be pretty much like humans and chimpanzees, or even orangutans uh, uh, hybridizing. So there's a lot of gene flow in this clade, which makes it very, very interesting, and you can see, I think the nice thing here is that you can see, we infer again, you see the population sizes, these are the width of these branches, you see them changing, obviously divergence times, and a lot of, and a lot of gene flow. So in this model, we, uh, we assume that there are potentially 44 directed uh, edges of gene flow, but only 14 of these show up with like rates above 1%, which we call significant. It's not you know, a rigorous statistic criterion, but that's, that's what we use. So we can draw these really nice images and you know, put them in paper and be very happy with ourselves. But there, there are a few things that always annoy me when we do this, so I, I really like this type of work, but there, there are a couple of things that don't really work that well. So first is the issue of, again, what I hinted to, the, the migration bands, right? So we throw a lot of migration bands into the model and we say, okay, this set is significant, but we don't really have a statistical test for that. We just put a threshold on the rate inferred rates and we say things below this threshold. That's, we're not gonna draw it in our nice images. That's pretty much what we do. Uh, and that's not very rigorous, but, but okay, that, that's, that's pretty sound. I think what we do is, is reasonably sound. But the other more uh, problematic issue has to do with the topology of the tree, right? So I tell you, this is, the, this is the population history we infer, right? But the tree, we don't infer the tree, right? We, that's part of the input for GFOX, right? So how do we get this tree, you ask? And it's a good question that I ask myself. So what we actually do, usually, right, is we run neighbor joining. We concatenate our loci together and just run neighbor joining us or, uh, or any other phylogenetic reconstruction method. Get a tree and say, look at it and say if it's reasonable or not. So when you do this here, you get this tree. It looks similar to the tree you saw before, but not quite. So when we looked at it, you know, and asked Bob, what do you think? Does this make sense? Do you want maybe to perturb some things to try different things and he said you know jackal being here doesn't completely make sense it seems like Ethiopian wolf should be kind of this wo big wolf coyote dog clade it uh, doesn't make a lot of sense for it to be an outgroup to jackal and when we look at the when we look at this you know we didn't have this but we like previous studies we knew that there is a lot of gene flow into jackal from like this wolf clade so that would kind of draw it in so, uh, so we decided, okay, you know, it's all it takes is, you know, double the runtime in parallel. We can try both, right? We can run our model with this and this, look at the results and, you know, decide for ourselves what, uh, what fits the data better. So we did this and we actually did better. Instead of two, we, we ran four runs, two without gene flow and two with gene flow, just to see how gene flow influences what we get. So I'm not going to show you all the parameter estimates because a lot of them are not really relevant, but you get a nice picture by looking just at the, how divergence times change as you change the model. So this is what happens when you don't have gene flow. So when we use our tree, our, the tree that we decided is the true one you know, after the fact, then indeed what you see here, so, so one way to kind of, um, one way to infer maybe that your model does not fit the data of that well is if the divergence time the split, is, is if the split times are glued together it means that maybe you want to switch the topology there to separate them more separation of divergence times means in a sense that you're describing more of the variance in your genomic data which should lead to better fit that's kind of the rationale so you see a lot of glued divergence times and indeed specifically here right this is the Ethiopian wolf when you have it, uh, when you have jackal outside, then it gets pushed down 
to that Ethiopian wolf divergence. It kind of wants to enter that clade. And indeed, when you flip the, when you let it enter that clade, it infers it to be much closer to the other wolves, right? So if you look at a model without gene flow, you definitely think this makes more sense because you know, the jackal wants to be inside. That's kind of the rationale. And that's what neighbor joining does. It, it doesn't assume gene flow. So it's consistent with this. Without gene flow, you would want to infer this tree. But now when you throw these 44 migration bands into the model, then you see that the jackal gets pushed back because a lot of this similarity is actually post-divergence gene flow. It's not because they have a shared, you know, a common shared ancestral population. It's because there was a lot of gene flow there. So it gets pushed back again against that Ethiopian wolf divergence. And when you let it exit that clade again, then it, it happily sits here with quite a bit of separation, right? So this is, you know, this is not rigorous by any means, but you can, we, this is what we do now, right? So this is what we use in the paper that we're writing to argue that this is probably, you know, the correct model for this. Yes? Couldn't you be more rigorous by calculating the likelihood value for the... That's what I'm going to show, yeah. But it's not straightforward, so that's the next slide, right? It's very good, yeah. <laughs> so what we want to do, thanks, Salon, uh, is, you know, we have these four models, and typically, so this is a typical setting that we, I've encountered now several times. So we usually, it's not like we have a very large space of, of alternative uh, hypotheses. It's maybe 10, right? So we can enumerate them and we can run an MCMC on each, right? And the question is, can we approximate this likelihood? So the problem is that the likelihood model doesn't give you this, right? Because you have to have all your latent variables. So there's no way to compute this. What we have with the MCMC is a set, you know, we have this series of samples of our latent variables and our latent variables are jointly these genealogies and the model parameters, right? So uh, for each of these we can compute the joint likelihood, but that in itself doesn't tell you much. Uh, one problem, if you just use these likelihoods, there's a problem, some models have maybe more parameters, some have less, there's a dimensionality issue. You really want to integrate over. You know, if you're, if you're a true Bayesian person, then you don't want to use kind of a pointwise likelihood. You really want to estimate these values, right? The probability of your data given the model. We have four models. We want to rank them by this. So we want to integrate over this latent space, which is obviously very complicated to do. But we, we do have the power. We do have this really nice tool to sample these values of these latent uh, variables under each model. So we run MCMC, we did that already here, right? We ran four MCMCs, but in order to convince you that this is the model that, that fits more, I had to wave my hands a lot and show you these images. I would want to do the same thing, run four MCMCs, but then have as a product kind of a score that I could plug in here and then rank them. That's what I want. Uh, and the idea is that you could think that this is probably not too tough a, of a task because you have uh, your sample is skewed, right? It wouldn't allow you maybe to compute directly in an unskewed integral, but you could use something like importance sampling to address that, right? So you have a sample. With this sample, you can try to approximate this integral of uh, probability of x and y given m. So how does that work? And this is, so this is not something new. This is the harmonic mean, which I already told you in the kind of first slide that is nice and elegant, but doesn't really work. But it does give you an idea of what might actually be able to work. So the idea here, and this was uh, drafted by Newton and Raftery in already in 94, is that we try to express our likelihood, or the inverse of the likelihood actually, as an expectation under the distribution, the posterior distribution of y given x and m. And why this? Because, because our MCMC samples are sampled approximately based on that distribution. So that's a distribution we sort of have access to. So we want to know what function of y and x do I have to record and do take the, the, the average value of in order to compute, in order to estimate, right, this likelihood or the inverse of the likelihood. 
right? So this expectation, you kind of, uh, you can um, expand to this integral, right? And then you want to express this inverse of the likelihood using an integral over y. So you just expand y as an integral of probability, conditional probability of y given m on uh, your y's. And you can, again, push this uh, into the integral. We did nothing here. And now we have kind of integrals over the same domain of one function and the other. And we just equate them to get our f pretty much, right? F has to be this ratio divided by this conditional of y given x and m. This is what we have here. And, you know, this is, you know, this is not a good time of day to follow these. But if you, if you want to do that later, you see that our f is just the inverse of the probability of the data given our latent space. That's the genealogies and model parameters, or just the genealogies, because that's all that matters in our model. So we get an expression of the inverse likelihood as a mean value of this f, which is the inverse of p of x given y. And now we can approximate this using our MCMC sampled y's, because they're approximately sampled according to this posterior distribution. So this is the idea behind what's called the harmonic mean estimator. It's called the harmonic mean because you take the harmonic mean of these likelihood values here that you already are recording. So you don't really have to do anything new. You are already sampling. These are values you're already computing. The MCMC has to compute them. You only have to output them in your trace files and then do this harmonic mean. So it's very, very simple to do. The problem is that it you know, doesn't really work for even fairly simple uh, problems. And the reason, there are various statistical reasons why it doesn't, there are you know, unbounded variants, and there is some bias also associated. People have been studying, trying to understand why this thing that should work doesn't really work ever. So I, I'm not going to get into that, but I do want to show you a demonstration of the fact that it doesn't work and maybe get some insights in what might be able to work. So you can think about this kind of a thought experiment that we actually experimented with in simulation you think about a very simple model. It has three populations and values for the model parameters. And you play with this divergence time, right? You start at zero, meaning that A and B are not divergent at all, and you know, play with it a bit. You have four values here. So we have four scenarios. Each scenario, we simulate two, two data sets just you know, for replicates. And each data set looks like this. It's 5,000 of these independent loci, length 1KB two diploid genomes per, per population. The details don't matter that much. And then we take this data and we run GFOX or you know, any other uh, Bayesian demography inference method you want. We run them on uh, each of these two models. So the first model is kind of the correct model. It has three populations, the right structure. And the second model is not really, you know, is a simplified version where A and B are fused together. You assume that they're the same population. So this is a model that should fit when the divergence is zero, but the fit kind of should uh, reduce as you, as you increase that divergence time. This is kind of the experiment. And we want to see if the harmonic mean estimator, if we look, try to estimate the likely this, the fit of this and the fit of this, and take uh, the uh, difference of their logs, if we can actually you know, make useful inference here. And this is what we get, and pretty much it, again, doesn't really work. So when your tau is zero, again, you get values that are practically zero, which makes sense. It doesn't really, yeah, you, you don't really prefer any of the models on top of each other. But it pretty much stays that way. Uh, even here at this kind of 20% mark, maybe starts catching a signal. But it's, you know, these, these error bars that we get from the replicates and all that, uh, they're pretty wide. So you can't confidently say that, that this is a true model. So even at this point, you don't really know that these are two separate populations. At this point, it seems like it's working. So it is working at some point, but it seems like it's fairly noisy. And, and, and this is probably the simplest kind of question you want to answer with this type of an approach. So some intuition in why you know this doesn't work well and why we thought we could quite easily make it work uh, much better is that when we make this comparison, we kind of 
treat each model separately. It's, it's part of also the, the nice part of, the, of this approach is that you don't have to compare the models directly, you just uh, estimate the likelihood for each model separately. But if the models are very similar, and these are very similar, there's only kind of one aspect where they're different, then it doesn't use this similarity in any way, right, in this estimate. So you can kind of think there is a shared component maybe to the variance of these estimators that you're not considering, and that, that really hurts you. And the idea is that, you know, as the models that you're trying to compare are more similar, you'd want your estimator to be more accurate. And the harmonic mean doesn't have that, it doesn't care, right? Uh, the, mo the models can be the same model, but you run twice the estimate and you're still going to get some difference. So, so it doesn't use this similarity of the model in any way. So we were asking ourselves, is there a way to directly estimate a Bayes factor, right? So a Bayes factor is just the ratio of these likelihoods. And this is what we're trying, this is what we're doing when we're separately estimating these and taking the ratio. But what we want to do is directly estimate the ratio of the likelihood of M2 to the likelihood of M1 from an MCMC sample of M1. So we run MCMC once on one model and use these samples to estimate the ratio of the likelihoods. So the question is, can we do this? So we, it seemed like it should be easy, but it took us, I think, two years to get all the details straight on this. So this is, I think, pretty much where I was, where we were last year, and, and a lot of what I'm going to show now is pretty much things we were able to advance uh, in this year. So the idea is, again, you want to, it, it, it's going to look very similar, all these equations to what we saw with the harmonic mean, but the objective is not to compute the inverse likelihood, but the ratio of the likelihoods. And we're going to do it the same way. We have access to these y's from the, an approximate posterior distribution, so we want to understand which function of the latent uh, variables y and the data we need to record uh, what's, uh, so that the mean of this is going to give us this Bayes factor. Right? So again, we expand this back. This expectation is this integral. And when we try to move forward as we did before, we can reach a bit of a roadblock. And the roadblock is that when we try to expand this as an integral, so the natural integral is an integral over the latent space of this reference model. In our case, that was our M2 with the two populations and not the three. And these are not the same. So, so one thing, again, that we were struggling for a while is that these are not, you know, these are not necessarily the same spaces. So we have to kind of move integration space. And they're also, they have different dimensions, so you want to be able to do that. So the way we do this, and I'm going to kind of delay the details a bit, is that we define what we call this model pairing probability uh, distribution or conditional distribution, this P tilde, uh, that allows you to do this. So uh, for now, you know, you're going to have to assume that there is such a P tilde that gives you this equation and allows you to move from an integral on your latent space in the reference model to the latent space in your kind of target model. And once you do this, then you do the same thing, move everything into the integral, equate, you know, solve for f, and you see that what you need, if you were able to define this p tilde, then the average values that you want to record are the ratios of these p, p tilde of y given the reference model and the probability, the actual probability of y given the target model. So this, so this kind of makes sense. And the nice features of it, so it looks similar to the harmonic mean, but there are su several, I think, important distinctions. So one thing is that, you know, kind of the bad thing is that you have to think a bit about how to define this, and I'm going to give you an example in a minute. But once you did this, uh, you get something that's much nicer. Earlier we had kind of an expectation of an inverse of some likelihood, so there's going to be a lot of variance there. The values are just going to be uh, very big, very large, uh, we're gonna, uh, so, and, the var and the variance is going to be proportionally very large. Here, these ratios can be actually pretty close to one. So say, say in the extreme that your reference model is the target model, then, then your p tilde is just going to be p, and this is going to be one, you know, constant, and then you get one. So that's, so in the kind of very, very, very silly case where you want to compare a model to itself, you just get an equation of one. Now, if the reference model is slightly different than your 
than your original model, you're not going to get one, but you're going to get something that's close to one, and the variance is going to be proportional. So you're, you're gonna, this is going to be much more efficient than be, being able to, than needing to estimate these separately and having to take their kind of ratio after the fact. So that was our intuition into why, uh, why this should work. And again, there are other features that I don't think I'll have time to get to that you can actually, so this is, this P tilde, why we call it P tilde and not a P, is that you actually have to define it. It's not naturally defined by your model. There are some degrees of freedom there that you can take, and you can actually use these degrees of freedom maybe to reduce your, uh, your variance even further. So I, I, I do want to give an example of what these P tilde would look like and how you can construct it maybe in a general setting. So let's look at this example we had, where this is our M, this is the model where we actually run the MCMC on, and this is our reference model that we want to compare against. And let's kind of line up the, the latent spaces of these two models. So first you can see that your original model, right, it has more parameters. It has this divergence time and it has these two population sizes, or three, and here it only has one population size for this part, right? So, so there is a higher dimension here. But a lot of things align really nicely, right? This C population is the same. This ancestral population here is, you know, it has the exact same meaning. So we can really draw nice lines between some of the parameters here and here, and the genealogies as well, you know. If you could embed a genealogy here, you could embed it here. So, so a lot of these are really kind of one-to-one -one correspondence. So if you think again about an integration space, that's easy, you just change parameter names. That's the easy part. Uh, where it gets slightly more complicated, so in order to fill this space, all we have to do is decide what to map to the size of this population. Now here we don't have a population that you know, really corresponds, it's like three populations, right? So you can think of various functions to do this. This is where the, these degrees of freedom come in. So what we tried you know, for a first step is just to try kind of the bigger population, the one that has probably the highest influence, and this is this uh, ancestral population here. So this is somewhat arbitrary to map this to this. It's the simplest choice. You could think of better ways of doing this, but we wanted just to see what this would give it, the, the, you know, the kind of the simplest thing we could do. So this now defines what we call this Y tilde. It's a subset of the parameters of your target model that are directly mapped to your reference model. So if you think of your target model as being having a higher dimension, think of a subspace of that that pretty much looks like the space of your reference model and you create a mapping. And then you're left with kind of three extra dimensions that are unmapped and if we want to move, let's kind of do this quickly, uh, not get into the details of the equations, uh, so if we want to change this integral over y tilde to this full integral over the full y, we need to introduce, again, these, these unmapped variables. And uh, to, to make this step, we just define a conditional probability distribution over these z's given the y tilde. So again, another degree of freedom, we can choose this uh, conditional probability distribution in various ways to maybe reduce our uh, variants. Just a few points about that. So, for instance, what are we left here with Z? It's these two, pop uh, the population sizes of A and B that don't, that are non-existent here in this divergence time. So the population sizes, we can just use the priors, uh, and that will kind of nicely cancel out with the denominator here. With the divergence time, there we had to work quite a bit, because we can't, you could say, okay, just use some arbitrary distribution, you can use the prior, the model has no, con like the, the divergence time has no, has no consequence here, so, so just sample a value, but that doesn't work because you need to have this constraint. You can't sample a value of your latent uh, variable under this p, p tilde if it has a zero probability in your target model because then you get ratios here that are undefined. So you have to make sure to define this conditional probability to sort of fit with the sense of in your target model. So in the divergence time, since you can't, we can't sample here a divergence time that is higher than this time here because it will kind of conflict with the coalescent structure in this genealogy. 
So we have to look at all our genealogies and see what is the bound on tau that we need. Okay, let's move on. Just show you that, that this works. So does it work? This is what we saw with the harmonic mean before, just scaled a bit differently. It doesn't work very well. And when we use our relative Bayes factors, uh, it kind of works nicely. It already picks a very strong signal here. I guess we need to do more simulations to show that, you know, somewhere around here it's where it's actually picking this up. Uh, and again, I think the important thing is that the variance is very low, so it seems like a very, very stable estimator, much more than the harmonic mean. Uh, okay, so I'm, we've also extended this to infer the, the topology. Again, not the detail, just to show you that it works. Uh, we, can, we can do the same. Again, the, the main questions we're interested in is understanding the structure of the phylogeny. So we could think of different structures of this three population phylogeny. We, sam we simulate under M1 and try to see which has more support. And again, it works. The harmonic mean doesn't work. It doesn't you know, differentiate. And this, our relative base factor, work as well. So we're not quite at the point where we can run this on this data. We have gene flow, which we figured out theoretically how to deal with, but we still need to implement. But we're pretty close. So, so I think we're pretty close to at least the first version of this that can actually work on a lot of these interesting problems. So first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, Ron Weisberg. He's a great master's student, my first master's student, who graduated with this uh, nice project. Um, and we have a running version that uh, we can actually run on data to see if it works. We need to still figure out this gene flow thing and the implementation. That's something that Ron owes me. And we have various other kind of extensions that I can talk about offline. So I think I was able to go through, through all of these. And the main thing I want you to take home from this is this idea of the relative base factor is a general thing. So most of you are not doing demography inference, so you might not care about that at all. But you might be running MCMC, right? So you have your data set and you have a model. And in and, and MCMC, you have some latent space that you're sampling over. And most cases, you're not sure about your model. So you might not know if it's M1 or M2. And the idea is that there always is some overlap between these spaces. It's not going to be complete. They're not going to have the same latent variable space, but there is going to be some overlap. So you want to think about the reference, some reference model, which is this, in this intersection, and compare each of them to this, and not just estimate their uh, marginal likelihood separately. Uh, so thank you. And if there's a room maybe for one question, yes. one question. 